Hey all. I know I haven't posted any videos for a while, and one reason is because I don't know that I've necessarily had one that I've been that excited to post. But the other reason is that I've been working on a new build, and that's been taking up a lot of my time. It's been sort of a roundabout build. What happened was, as you may know, there was a big shortage of DJI components. And especially, one couldn't get Vistas with the real DJI cameras on them. But air units were available, and I had an opportunity to buy one. So rather than missing out on the opportunity to get any high-def camera gear, I chose to buy one of those. Of course, then I needed a frame that I could put it into, and it turns out they don't fit that well into most frames. I have been able to stuff one into a, a standard QAVR2, but it didn't fit very well. It was a tight squeeze, and I wanted to do something a little bit more straightforward this time. So I looked for other frames, and the one that looked the most promising was the Impulse Apex HD frame, which is the Apex frame, but with a little bit more space in the back to fit an air unit. According to pretty much everybody's reviews, the Impulse Apex, not necessarily the HD version, is a very well-received frame with really good handling characteristics. It's very rigid and it's very durable. So I was pretty excited to try it, realizing that maybe the HD version wouldn't necessarily have the same characteristics, but should still be a great frame. The Apex is narrower and more slammed than the QAVR2, but longer due to the rear deck space provided for the air unit. The carbon is thick and pretty, but unchamfered. Also, many of the carbon parts showed a burr on one side, which was surprising and a little bit disappointing. The arm configuration is complex with a split lower deck and the keystone piece, but it is very rigid and solid. The arms and lower deck plate block access to the heads of the stack bolts. It's been claimed that this is not a problem, but it did turn out to be later in the build when I ended up having to replace the nuts that secure the stack screws with lower profile ones. The arms themselves are very sturdy, but they include a blind hole beneath the motor rather than a straight through hole. I would prefer a through hole to allow uh, water to drain from beneath the stator foot and also to have access for adjusting tension on the shaft screws of the motors as the motor bearings wear. The frame also uses hex standoffs, and I like the hex standoffs because you can grab them with a wrench to turn them well, but the flats of the front four are actually tight against the FPV camera plates for support, and that makes aligning them critical and wrenching them or using them as mount points for other stuff, like to zip tie and tenny or battery leads to, pretty impractical. The rear four standoffs brace the air unit but they do so so tightly that they prevent sneaking the antennae out between the standoffs and the air unit. In general, the tightness of the Apex frame combined with the cabling constraints of the flight stack and the air unit made this a hugely more challenging build than I think it should have been, or certainly than I had expected. The first challenge was mounting the air unit. As I checked out other folks' builds before I started mine, I noticed that most of them either zip-tied the two air unit antennae together, which made for something that was kind of floppy and would get stuck in the props, or they used third-party 3D printed parts that extended from the rear standoffs, but that added weight and created an impact point aft of the quadcopter. I wanted to get the antennae in nice and tight, and it took me a while to figure out a good way to do this. As I mentioned earlier, one thing that made it hard to mount the air unit was that there was little space to thread the antennae out between the air unit and the rear standoffs. Since I couldn't route the antennae beside the air unit, I'd have to route them up and over the top of the air unit and under the top plate to get them somewhere to mount them. And the problem with running the antennae up is that there's a lip on the upper edge of the air unit and that pushes against the connectors of the antennae and tends to make them pop out. 
Eventually, I came up with the idea to mount the air unit upside down, and this allowed me to route the antennae with the connectors so they wouldn't pop out and keep them close to the aircraft so I could actually zip tie them to the rear two standoffs. I haven't seen anybody else mount the antennae this way, so I'm excited to share it with you, and I hope it helps if you choose to build this frame. In addition to this approach allowing me to route the antennae without any sort of 3D printed holder or having to zip tie them together, I find that the reception I'm getting at the headset is very good. The antennae seem to be in a really good location for not being blocked by the battery or the body carbon. Another challenge I had with this frame was fitting in the ESC. The tabs, which would typically point out towards the rear from the 4-in-1 ESC, were so close to the air unit that I didn't feel I would be able to route out and solder on the battery lead properly. So I followed Joshua Bardwell's example. He did a build of the Apex HD as well and I turned the ESC 180 degrees so that the tabs were pointing toward the front. And that was okay, but then I found that the cable that I used to connect the ESCs to the flight controller was too short to do anything other than also have to turn around the flight controller 180 degrees. So now the whole stack was rotated by 180 degrees. That's fine, but it requires changing beta flight, the orientation of the gyroscope, and also remapping the motors so that they appear in the right places as far as beta flight is concerned. Now that I had the air unit orientation, the antennae mounting, and the stack orientation ironed out, I still needed to get the top plate on. And that's my next criticism about this frame, which is that the available height for the stack is just about two to four millimeters shorter than it should be. In order to use this frame, with a 4-in-1 ESC, you need to run a very low profile flight stack. What I found was that the components in the flight stack were catching on the battery strap up above, and what I ended up doing was actually not using the stock nuts to hold on the flight stack screws, which are nice lock nuts, but which raised the 4-in-1 ESC a couple more millimeters than it needed to be. Instead, I ended up using some flat standard nuts, and that was the point at which I had to get at the heads of the stack screws, which were embedded within the frame rather inconveniently. The next part of laying out the build was figuring out a place to put the tracer receiver that I use, and also a powered beeper, because I like to run a beeper in addition to the motor beepers. And I was able to get those things to fit up adjacent to the camera at the nose of the aircraft. That left the last thing, which was to route the twin small dipole antennae that come with the tracer, and I ended up attaching those to the arms beneath the motor wires. Now the Apex comes with some really nice motor wire covers or protectors, and I was able to use those in the rear, but I wouldn't be able to use them in the front unless I made cuts in them somehow to allow the tracer antennae to poke out crosswise. Ultimately, I didn't use them. I ended up using the old steel trick of using some pieces of prop to cover up the wires and protect them held in place with electrical tape. With everything finally assembled, the all-up weight without the GoPro is just under 600 grams. With the weight of a Hero 5 Session, that's about 72 grams and a little Bluetooth tile finder that I like to use, that's about seven and a half grams, and some very lightweight foam feet, rather than using the little plastic feet that came with the quad to save some more weight. The final weight is about 679 grams, all up. So while it's not racing quad weight, it's a pretty respectable weight for a freestyle quad. Unfortunately, even though I thought I had finished building it at that point, I had to rebuild it a couple more times because of faulty flight controller and ESC components. The vendors I used were really great about supporting those things. One was a private vendor, but I'd like to mention GetFPV and Race Day Quads for really standing behind their products and providing great support. In the course of replacing those stack components, 
there were a couple of lessons learned. One is that although they came with 12 gauge battery leads, 14 gauge turned out to be a lot easier to work with, both to solder and to route through the frame of the quad, and it provides plenty of current. The other thing that I learned was that while the flight controllers provide voltage regulators for powering the air unit, which can't accept over about 17 volts, those regulators will drop out if you're running on only 4S, which I do, and your batteries sag too low. So what I found was happening sometimes when I was abusing a battery, the voltage would sag and the video would drop out on me. It takes a while for DJI to reboot, so I'd be flying blind because the quadcopter would still be running. The motors were still spinning fine. What I ended up doing to handle that problem was simply not to use the voltage regulators or the battery elimination circuits that were provided by the flight controller. Instead, I routed the power to the air unit directly from the battery. This guarantees that the air unit will keep transmitting video right until the quadcopter falls out of the sky, so I don't have to worry about that. On the other hand, it also means that I can't plug in anything over a 4S battery to this quad. I can't plug in a 5S or a 6S, or I'll burn out the air unit. So I actually wrote a little note on the battery connector plug to remind myself or anybody else who might fly this quad to only plug in 4S batteries. Finally, everything was together and working properly, and I could begin tuning. Initially, I just flew it on the Betaflight defaults, and those were okay, but as I started pushing some tricks through it, I certainly wanted to do my own tuning. So I've been doing that ever since, and it's still not quite perfect, but at this point, I'll stop telling you about the story and just put in some flight video. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope my commentary on the build helps you if you decide to build one of these or one similar to it. Please feel free to post any questions in your comments below. Happy to hear from you and get back to you. Catch you later.